Welcome everyone to my online course for research methods in psychology. My name is Frank Lociavo and I am your instructor. I have a few important things to discuss with you, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. In the last video, we discussed how to evaluate association claims. You might recall that association claims typically emerge from correlational research studies, where researchers measure two or more variables and test to see if those variables are associated or correlated. As I mentioned, the words association and correlation are different, but for research purposes, they mean the same thing. If there is an association between two variables, then there is a correlation between those variables. And that means that the two variables co-vary. So, as the value of one variable changes, the value of the other variable will change as well, in some predictable way. For example, there is an association, or a correlation, between study time, measured in minutes or hours, and exam scores. Those two variables co-vary. In this example, as study time increases, exam scores increase as well. It's relatively easy to establish an association between two variables, but it's a bit more complicated to establish a causal relationship between two variables. I'm sure you've all learned at some point that correlation does not imply causation, or that correlation does not prove causation. That's true, because causal claims require more than just covariation between variables. To support a causal claim, researchers must conduct a well-controlled experiment that establishes temporal precedence and internal validity. Without those three criteria, covariation, temporal precedence, and internal validity, a research study cannot provide sufficient evidence of a causal relationship between two variables. So, in this video, I'll discuss those three critically important criteria, and I'll provide an example to help make each of those concepts more clear. All right, let's get to work. Let's walk through a quick example to determine if the research in question meets the three criteria for establishing causation. We'll keep it simple. Let's assume I conducted a research study focused on my students. Immediately before my students completed their first midterm exam, I asked them to report how many hours over the past two weeks they studied for the exam. After they completed the exam, I calculated their exam scores. So now I have data for two variables. I've measured each student's study time, which I've labeled variable A, and I've calculated each student's exam score, which I've labeled variable B. To summarize the data, I divided the students into two groups. One group has students who did not study for the exam. They reported studying zero hours over the past two weeks. The other group has students who did indeed study for the exam, one or more hours over the past two weeks. So in other words, for this research project, I'm interested in comparing students who studied for the exam with students who did not study for the exam. It turns out that students who didn't study scored 68% on the exam. Students who studied one or more hours scored 83%. That represents a difference between a D plus and a B. That's a pretty big difference. So, Am I justified claiming that studying leads to higher grades? Remember, the words we use matter. When I claim that studying leads to higher grades, I'm suggesting that studying causes higher grades. That's fine, as long as my research project meets the three criteria necessary for establishing causation, covariation, temporal precedence, and internal validity. Let's take a closer look. One criterion is covariation, which simply assesses if the two variables are related. We can ask ourselves, as the amount of studying changes, do grades change? The answer is yes. There is clearly at least some variation between the grades of those who studied and those who did not. This study meets the requirement of covariation. Let's move on. Temporal precedence refers to the importance of timing. If I want to claim that studying leads to higher grades, 
then studying for an exam must come before students earn grades for that exam. So we can ask ourselves, were measurements of study hours taken before students completed their exams and earned their grades? And clearly, the answer is yes. That means this study meets the requirement for temporal precedence. So far, so good. Let's move on. The final criterion necessary for establishing causation is internal validity. A research study is internally valid when there's only one plausible explanation for the differences we see. In this case, the difference in grades between those who studied and those who did not. In other words, is study time the only plausible reason for the differences we see in exam scores? Internal validity is critically important for establishing causation, because if another plausible explanation exists, then we'll be left somewhat confused because we won't know exactly which factor was responsible for the differences in exam scores. It helps to ask ourselves if study time is the only difference between the groups, because if the groups differed in some other systematic way, then that group difference might be responsible for the differences we see in exam scores. Personally, the first thing I ask myself is, did the two groups start off equally? In this case, it's not clear that they did. For example, students who do not study might be fundamentally different than students who do study. Is it possible that students who study for exams are simply brighter than students who do not study for exams? Yes, that makes lots of sense. It's definitely possible. So now I'm confused about the results. Are the differences in exam scores due to the fact that some students studied and some students did not? Or is the difference due to the possibility that students who study are brighter than students who do not study? This type of confusion suggests that a confound exists. In this study, study hours are confounded with student intelligence. And as a result, it's difficult to say with confidence that studying led to higher grades. Because it's quite possible that the students with higher grades were simply brighter students and that they would have outscored the other students regardless of whether they studied or not. By the way, I can think of several other confounding factors as well, and each chips away at the internal validity of this research project. For example, it's possible that the students who studied are more serious about school. It's possible that the students who studied work fewer hours, so they were able to think about academic issues more than other students. It's possible that students who studied have a better understanding of how school works, and they better understand test-taking strategies, and that's why they outscored the other students. Here's the bottom line, my friends. Those are all reasonably plausible alternative explanations for the results. And unfortunately, my research study wasn't designed to control for or rule out any of those alternative explanations. So, if I'm honest, I need to admit that I'm not really sure if studying caused some students to earn higher exam scores. It's possible that they earned higher scores for some other reason, some other reason that I didn't test. That means this study fails to meet the requirement for internal validity. Although two out of three sounds pretty good, to establish causation, you need to meet each of the three criteria, with no exceptions. So, let's revisit one of the first questions I asked. Am I justified claiming that studying leads to higher grades? Because I failed to meet the three criteria necessary for establishing causation, I am not justified using causal language. The only fair way to describe my results is to use language that describes simple associations. So, for example, I'd be justified claiming that studying is associated with higher grades, or that studying is correlated with higher grades, or I could say that students who studied earned higher grades. Those are all fair statements because each avoids suggesting a causal link. Now that you understand the three criteria for establishing causation, we can more fully discuss how to check causal claims in the next video. So that's it for this section, but stay tuned because I'll have more to say about research methods 
in the next video.